Runaway by Half Alive, and this is the Chord Cutest. This is an interesting deck for a few reasons. The first is that it sits in a bit of an interesting price point. There's a lot of decks at the sort of $700 mark. The Topping uh, D90, Denifrips Ares 2, RME ADI 2, and there's a lot of decks at the sort of $2,000 and up mark. But there's not much at about $1,500, which is where this sits. It's a little bit cheaper in the UK, about $1,200, which, given as we pay VAT on everything, actually works out comparatively cheaper. There's not many direct competitors to this, and so it's in a bit of its own gap in the market. The second reason is that this is a Chord deck. Now, Chord doesn't do things the same way as other DAC companies. Other DAC companies will take an off-the-shelf chip, usually from AKM or ESS, although some other companies will use chips from analog devices or Burr Brown. Brightcaster uses analog devices, all of iFi stuff is Burr Brown, but Chord doesn't do that. Chord develops their own DAC chips via use of an FPGA. An FPGA is a field programmable gate array. It's a microprocessor that you can program to do whatever you want. And that allows Chord to do some interesting things. A Delta Sigma DAC, which is what most DACs are, operates in a kind of interesting way. I've got a video coming explaining exactly how different DAC topologies work. What is a Delta Sigma DAC? What is an R2R DAC? How does oversampling work? Each step in the uh, digital to analog conversion process. But all you need to know for now is that a Delta Sigma DAC is a switch. It can only be on or off. If music calls for 0.8 volts and your DAC's maximum output is 1 volt, then what it does is it will switch itself on and off really, really, really fast, with it being on about 80% of the time, so that when a low-pass filter is applied, it averages out to about 0.8 volts. The problem with that, that most DACs face, is that that generates switching noise. There's a lot of different ways of getting rid of that. Chord has kind of an interesting way of going about it. Chord uses a pulse array design, which means they have a series of 10 staggered switching elements instead of the typical one that a normal Delta Sigma DAC will have. This helps to effectively combat jitter and switching noise because each rising edge of data coincides with a falling edge. This helps to reduce both signal dependent patterns in distortion as well as noise floor modulation. That's the first thing that makes Chord DACs a little bit unique. The second thing is that all Delta Sigma DACs have to oversample. They have to take the 44.1 kilohertz information you give them and convert it to a higher sample rate. All Delta Sigma DACs do this. It's not something you can avoid unless you buy an R2R DAC. But the maths, the filter that you use to do this, makes a difference to quality. Most DACs, the number of coefficients for their filter will be couple hundred to a thousand-ish, maybe. Chord deliberately uses FPGAs with more compute power available so that they can use much higher quality oversampling filters. The filter in the Qtist has around 49,000 taps, the one in the Dave has over 160,000 taps, and then they also sell the M-Scaler. The M-Scaler is not a DAC, it is a dedicated oversampling device which has over a million coefficients for its filter. Coefficients and taps uh, are used interchangeably. And so, Chord DACs don't really sound like most other Delta Sigma DACs. Whether or not you like them is a different question. And I'll be getting on to whether or not I like this in a sec. But first, let's talk about the build. I should also start by saying I was sent this DAC by Havoc, aka Naivo. He's a friend of mine. Thank you very much for sending this in. This is not mine. I didn't pay for this. I'm not being paid to say anything about this. I have nothing to do with Chord or any other audio company for that matter. All thoughts and opinions are my own. The build. Okay. The aesthetics of Chord products are... Let's just call them polarizing. Um, <laughs> I'm of the opinion that I think they'd probably sell quite a few more if they just had a plain black box option of each of their products. Some people really like the aesthetics, though. So, hey, to each their own. What isn't up for debate, though, is the build quality. The build quality on this is stunning. This might look like plastic. It's not. It's metal. The whole thing is solid metal. This thing weighs about two pounds, just under a kilogram. It's solid. The finish is gorgeous. The text is gorgeous. The glass is gorgeous. You can see all the internals, and it's on this nice black PCB. The build quality is stunning. And that goes for most of Chord's products. I'm not such a fan of the Dave, but uh, I'll get onto that in another video. The build quality on the Qtist is fantastic. In terms of connectivity... 
USB, dual BNC in, which I'll get into in a sec, optical SPDIF, it uses a 5 volt power supply. I'm using an iFi iPower power supply right now, it does come with one obviously, but I like to use something just a little bit better, just so that all the DACs I review are on an even playing field. Single-ended RCA output. Now, I've got mixed thoughts about single-ended versus balanced. On paper, there is no reason for short runs like this why balanced should actually be any audible level of better. But some amps do not have a good single-ended input stage. A good example of this is the THX 789. I had that for a while. When you connect a single-ended DAC to this, or even the same DAC, but using the single-ended output, it did not send sound as good. This can be due to a lot of different things. One common cause is that some amps will use a pretty trash op-amp to generate an inverted signal when you're connecting single-ended. And that can degrade quality. So sometimes single-ended can be worse, but it's not because of this DAC. The output from this DAC is fantastic, and if you use an amp which has a good single-ended input stage or a dedicated single-ended amp, uh, single amp, you won't have any problems. It sounds fantastic on my setup, but some amps, like the 789, it might be problematic. I've been using it USB. USB through my SMS 200 Ultra. That's my streamer that I use for most DAC reviews because that's how most people are going to be using it. Most people are going to be using this USB just connected to their PC. It has galvanic isolation on the USB. Galvanic isolation means that it's electrically disconnected, which is nice because then no electrical noise from your beefy gaming PC, which is just about the worst device you could put in an audio chain, is going to affect the DAC in any way. Even if you can't hear noise outright, it can still have a negative effect on sound. And that's because there's a lot of other stuff in your DAC, which even if you can't hear noise, can be negatively impacted. Clocks being a good example. Clocks are voltage controlled oscillators. And so if there are fluctuations in the voltage feeding them because it's connected to a really noisy PC, then it can degrade performance. Having galvanic isolation is really nice to see. I wish DAX, more DACs did that. Dual BNC. It's got regular SPDIF input. The dual BNC is so that you can connect it to an M scaler. Normal SPDIF goes up to about 192 kilohertz. Technically, you can do higher, but most DACs are limited to 192. To use the M scaler to get to the full 768 kilohertz, Core developed the dual BNC protocol. That's unique to Core DACs. You use two connections, and you can get full 768 kilohertz from an M scaler to your cutest. I didn't use the M scaler for most of this review because that's not how most people are going to be using it. I'll talk about the combination of these two and how it compares to like a Dave on its own in a little bit. Most people are going to be wanting to know, how does this DAC sound? I want to pay $1,500 for this DAC, not $5,000 for this package. How does the cutest sound? And so I'm going to talk about that. The best word I can use to describe this DAC is refined. This is an exceptionally resolving, smooth without being laid back, and refined sounding DAC. It has a very interesting ability in that it can make bad masters sound a lot better than they actually are, and it can also smooth out certain types of flaws. It's incredibly difficult to make this DAC sound fatiguing. Good song for this. Do It All The Time by I Don't Know How But They Found Me. The vocals in this track are just a little bit sibilant. On an ESS DAC, like a, a really aggressive, cheap one, this does not sound good. This sounds really, really bad, and it's pretty unbearable. On a smooth, unresolving DAC, it's listenable, but it's obviously not very detailed. This DAC does an excellent job of smoothing over the sibilance without losing detail. You can hear that the vocals should be sibilant. You can hear that that aggression is there, but it doesn't feel aggressive. It doesn't lose that aggression. It doesn't lose the inherent characteristics of the music. It just refines the edges a little bit. And that's really, really nice. That works really, really well with a lot of music. Stuff like this, this song sounds better on the cutest than a lot of other DACs I've tried. But this fixing of your music can also be a little bit of a curse. Miracle by Caravan Palette. In fact, no, let's talk about the separation first. 
Separation is an absolute standout point of this deck. The separation that this deck provides, allowing you to pick out individual elements in the music, and the imaging, the directionality of each one is nothing short of phenomenal. It's absolutely fantastic, and it competes in that regard with decks way more expensive than what this is priced at. Puma by Andrew Bird. Let's just go to 48 seconds in. You've got several vocalists. You've got the main vocalist here. You've got someone going, ah, in the background. You've got drums. You've got someone picking at a guitar. And everything is so distinctly separate and clear. It's really, really impressive. The ability for busy mixes to sound so coherent and concise is fantastic on this deck. And I really, really, really like that. The problem is that sometimes it can sound a little bit forced. Sometimes, as with the sibilance taming, the separation can interfere with how the track should sound. Miracle by Caravan Palace. I skip to the vocals at about a minute in. This track, the way that they've got the effect on the vocals, it almost sounds like there are two of them overlaid, even though there's not. On the Dave, it's fine, there is one vocalist in front of you. On the Cutest, it almost sounds like the Cutest is getting in the way and just trying to push those two phantom vocalists apart to separate them more. Even though they're not two vocalists, it's just one. The separation is, at times, just a touch artificial. See, so yeah, this part in the track, when there's no vocals and everything is supposed to be distinct, it's great, it's fantastic, and it sounds a lot better on this than it does on an ADI-2, for example. I do actually have an ADI-2, but it's in Germany being fixed at the moment, so I can't compare directly here. I should also mention, I've got this. This is what I use to compare DACs. I don't just like to review DACs by listening and then unplugging everything and switching, because then memory gets in the way. This, I can group everything in Rune, and then just switch between them. That's what I've been doing with the Cutest, and that's what I'll be doing with all my other DAC reviews. There are some things, when you're listening to this, like the separation issue. It's not actually an issue if you're just listening to the Cutest. If you plug the Cutest in, and you just listen to the Cutest, you won't notice that. You'll enjoy the fantastic separation it provides in a lot of music, and you'll think, this is fantastic, which it is. But you won't notice the problem like I did on that mix. The only reason I noticed that is because I was directly A-being against another deck. And so it's important to note that, because I don't want to make something sound like a bigger problem than it is, because it's not actually a problem, it's just something I noticed. I'm reviewing this deck, and so I need to point out the good stuff, and the stuff which is either bad or just interesting. I mentioned the Taming of Sibilance. This DAC sounds phenomenal with classical and orchestral music. Howl's Moving Castle. Let's do Merry-Go-Round of Life. This track by the Grassini Project is beautiful. The timbre of the strings on my left the piano just over here, the tonal density and the, the tam resolution as well, everything is just fantastic in this track. And for genres like this, this DAC is really in its home turf. It sounds fantastic. But this is a very refined sounding DAC, and sometimes that doesn't work too well. Tense by Bronson. This is an interesting track. It was made on a plane. Uh, as in, the guy literally produced it on his laptop whilst flying on a plane. And he quite deliberately left it very, very aggressive and dirty and unrefined. If I go to 152, the synth here on something like a Dave even, let's stick with chord, 
the Dave makes this sound fast and dirty and aggressive and in your face. But the cutest is trying a little bit too hard to fix the aggression. And as a result, you can hear that it's there, but you're not feeling that aggression. You're not feeling like the low end is punching you. You're not feeling like that synth is just a little bit edgy when it should be. This is the kind of DAC which, if it was a person, would be in a tweed jacket drinking tea, and you'd ask him if he wanted to go to a classical concert or a play or something. If you wanted to go to a Disclosure concert or go dirt biking, you wouldn't take Mr. Q, you'd ask your mate Dave. That's the best way I can describe this DAC. It's an exceptionally refined signature, and that works phenomenally with orchestral and classical and acoustic music, and stuff that's mastered well. It doesn't work all that well with EDM or some pop music, because it leaves you wanting just a little bit more slam, a little bit more excitement. Microdynamics, timbre, and resolution are strong points of this DAC. Slam and macrodynamics, not so much. If we go Anthology by Overwork, I used this in my Blessing 2 review. We just go to... You can hear, again, that that should be a little bit more punchy. And if you listen to that on an ADI-2 even, uh, or a Dave, or whatever, any other DAC pretty much, it will be quite fast, and it will be punchy and smack you in the chest with that bass. But on the cutest, it's trying a little bit too hard to be refined. It's trying a little bit too hard to fix it, and it takes away just a touch of the excitement. This is a refined DAC, and I really, really, really like it. I can't actually put into words how good it sounds for a lot of orchestral music, but for EDM and stuff where you want it to be a little bit faster and more gritty, it sometimes sounds a little bit too polite. There's a lot to like about this DAC. The overall signature and resolution and performance, I think, sits very, very well at its price point. It's definitely more resolving than an ADI-2. I haven't tried the D90. I think an Ares 2 versus this would be quite an interesting comparison. With Chord, you're paying a little bit more, not just for the performance, but for the build. This is a DAC that was designed and built in the UK. It's going to cost more than something that was made in China or Singapore or whatever. You are paying for the country of origin in some manners, and that's fine. That's something which a lot of people are happy to pay for. A lot of people will pay more for something that wasn't made in China. But at the same time, if something from China for $700 is matching this in performance for twice the cost, it's still something you have to keep in mind. So I think it sits very well at its price point. I think this would best an ADI 2 if you're ignoring the feature set. An Ares 2, I think, might be a good substitute for this if you're looking to spend less. It doesn't compete with, like, a Hollow Spring 2. I think a Hollow Spring 2 is going to walk all over this. But again, that's more expensive. So I think it sits well at its price point. It's fantastic for orchestral. It's fantastic for classical. It's fantastic for most genres of acoustic music. But for EDM, for dubstep or, you know, grittier types of music, it's not going to be the best choice. This is a refined tea-drinking Mr. Q. That is your mate Dave, who's got a Lamborghini and vapes and goes dirt biking and yeah it's it's a fantastic DAC but it's a little bit colored in a lovely way for certain genres though let's talk about this I've seen a few videos and a few questions about people talking saying should I get an M scaler for my cutest will a M scaler and cutest combo give me a Dave the short answer to that is no a Dave out resolves a cutest and M scaler it's it gives better staging, it gives better micro and macro dynamics, it's faster, it's... This is a better DAC. Not by a small margin either. The Dave is a truly phenomenal DAC. But this is still a fucking good upgrade. Let's put back on 
In fact, let's do a different song. Let's do Best Behaviour by Manchinette. I No, no, let's do Eye for an Eye. Eye for an Eye by Bob Moses. This track for soundstage is fantastic. And what I'm going to do is, whilst I'm playing it, I'm going to switch between direct input, which I'm going uh, doing now, and then if I change that to blue, that means it's using dual BNC from the M scaler. So let's just get it back on USB. At the moment, it sounds good, it sounds refined and detailed and resolving, but it's a little bit closed in. This isn't a DAC that stages too well on its own. It's good, but it's not exceptional in that regard. The imaging, layering, and separation, though, do make up for that in quite a lot of respects. When I turn the M scaler on, though, Suddenly everything is just out there. Suddenly it goes from being here, kind of, uh, you know, in my head, a foot in front, to several feet away. Everything is sounding so much more spacious and... Just outright resolving. The resolving power and the space, the physical space between elements, when you turn the M scaler on, just goes up to 11. It is a really, really impressive DAC when you add an M scaler to it. With an M scaler, this is really sounding like a 2000, 2500 even dollar DAC. And this versus like a Hollow Spring 2 would probably be a close call. It's still not super fast in macrodynamics and slam. It does still lack that excitement a little bit, but the resolving power, the space and staging just goes up to 11 when you turn this on. I don't think this is worth the money if you have a cutest. I think this is a fantastic upgrade, but this is a $1,500 product and it's good at $1,500. It's great. This is a fantastic product. And if you've got a Dave, it makes a big difference. And if you've got a Dave, $3,000 for your $8,500 DAC or whatever it costs in the US is something to consider. Spending $3,500 on a DDC or Upscaler or whatever you want to refer to this as for your $1,500 DAC is not worthwhile. This is a package does not compete with a Hollow May. This is a package gets you halfway to a Dave. It's an upgrade, but please don't spend three and a half grand when you could definitely be spending the money better by upgrading your DAC. Just the same as you shouldn't spend $2,000 on a power supply for a $1,500 DAC. I really, really like the cutest. I think this is a fantastically refined, engaging house sound. It is a resolving, texturally... And the, tim the timbral performance is just phenomenal. Timbre on this DAC of just about everything is a lot better than just about any AKM or ESS DAC under its price. I really can't find many negative things to say other than the, the slight lack of slam and the fact that the staging without an M scaler is just okay. It's not bad. It's about the same as an ADI 2. But a lot of people like that. A lot of people want a more intimate sound. A lot of people want a closer in, more... It's not It's not that it's analytical, it's just that you can pick the stuff out a little bit better if everything is closer to you. The separation, the warmth, the depth and engaging sound this provides is great. If you're looking at a DAC for $1,500 or less, this is great if you listen to a lot of classical. This is great if you listen to a lot of orchestral. This is great if you listen to a lot of acoustic and even rock music. If you listen to a lot of pop, EDM, that kind of stuff, you should probably be looking at something like a D90 or an ADA2. ADA2 is great just because the feature set really does kick it up a notch, although if you've got Rune, then it's mostly redundant. 
I think the Cord Cutest is a fantastic product. The separation is great, but can feel forced. The resolution is just always good. This is a fantastic product. Hopefully you found that review engaging and interesting. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, all the money that I get from that is going back into buying audio stuff. Everything I get in review will be then resold, so money goes a long way. If I buy something for a grand, resell it for 900, it's only cost me 100 quid. I've got reviews coming for the Dave, for the Hollow May, AHB2, and a bunch of other stuff as well. So please do subscribe if you'd be interested in seeing that. Additionally, if you're a patron of mine, then you get a say in what stuff I purchase to review next. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed.